Good afternoon. Uh, I believe that this is one of the opening panels of the Aspen Ideas Festival, so welcome. It's one of the highlights of my year, I'm sure, for everyone else, too. I'm Kadeshi Freeland. I'm the editor of Thomson Reuters Digital, and uh, my friends at The Atlantic have asked me to moderate this session. Uh, actually, very appropriately, uh, The Atlantic has just come out with its ideas issue, and they, I actually got two big ideas in, which I was delighted about. And one of my big ideas was the return of fossil fuels. Uh, so uh, it was a real pleasure for me to be invited to do this. Um, we're going to be talking about is there a middle way it, in the whole discourse about energy, about fossil fuels, about renewable sources of fuel, uh, about the environment. Uh, we're going to have about an hour and a half, an hour and 15 minutes. We have a panel here that brings together some industry experts. Uh, some think tank and academia experts, and a filmmaker whose work we are actually going to see. Um, and I want to, for disclosure purposes, let everybody know that the film has been sponsored by Shell. Uh, so you can question the good people of Shell as to why they did that and what message they were trying to get across. Uh, the way that we're going to organize this is uh, I'm going to very briefly go down the line of the panelists. They'll all make some quick introductory remarks. We'll watch Greg's great film for about seven minutes. Then we on the panel will talk about it for about 20 minutes. Then we will watch another six-minute film, talk about it some more, and then throw it open to questions. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to run down the panel. They'll make a few opening remarks, and we'll get going. Alexis. Thank you. I'm Alexis Karolidis. I'm from Rocky Mountain Institute, and so all of you local folks probably know that we're a, a think tank based here in, um, think tank and do tank, based here in the valley. And our focus is resource efficiency and um, transferring the United States off of fossil fuels right now is our big focus. We recently published the book Reinventing Fire, which has a roadmap to that transition from fossil fuels today to a, uh, a mix of renewables, efficiency being primarily important, and uh, some natural gas in 2050. So uh, my background is in physics and architecture. I've been at RMI for about 14 years, and I'm really delighted to be here to uh, to be involved in this discussion. Okay, next, Russ <coughs> Ford. He is Executive Vice President Onshore for Shell Upstream. That's right, I've, I've worked with Shell for a little over three decades right now, and my job is to lead the development of oil and gas in the onshore arena in the Americas. Um, maybe a little bit about why this topic is of interest to us. I mean, I, I think fundamentally, we as society in the world face an energy challenge that's gonna be as big as any challenge we face in any other topic over the next, over the next several decades. Um, you know, you think about population growth, everybody talks about population growth, but the magnitude is something that's really incredible to me. I've got two daughters in university right now, and by the time they retire, the world is going to have added another population the size of China twice over. That's a pretty staggering fact. And a billion people are going to enter in the near term the market for energy, so the energy to run automobiles, washing machines, laptops, you, you name it. And, and our forecasting is not perfect, but our scenario planners tell us that unless there is some kind of a difference in the, in the growth um, of, of the supply of energy or the demand for that energy, the sustainable supply of energy as we know it will not make the, meet the demand that all those people will require. Um, hence the energy challenge. And there's a supply and a demand side of that. I clearly play in my day job on, on the supply side of it. But the supply sides become a lot more, more a lot more difficult. Uh, it, there are a lot more challenges there, not just technical challenges. I mean, I deal with those all the time, and I'm happy to talk to anybody about technology. That's cool stuff. I, I can do that. But there's more society challenges to understand and be able to describe the impact of our development onshore to our constituents, to our stakeholders, to people whose lives are impacted by that. Um, to get the word out and information out and sometimes disabuse uh, myths that are out there on what energy development can really mean. Um, last year at this forum at the Aspen Ideas Institute, Shell took its first step towards making more information available by introducing our operating principles. So five principles that we try to adhere to with respect to uh, air emissions, water, uh, water handling, uh, wellbore design, the footprint, footprint we occupy on the, on the surface and how we interact with communities. 
And that's been useful for us, but I think the next step is to try to get the word out and, and try to help people understand what this energy equation is all about. Um, we realize that when we step out into the arena, there's going to be a lot of challenges out there, sometimes challenges that we don't like to hear to our business, but our position tends to be those challenges are, are healthy things when they come from the rational middle, from people who really want to have a debate and try to solve issues, so that's primarily why we're here today. Okay, and next we're going to hear from Richard Newell of Duke University. Richard? Uh, th thanks. Uh, Richard Newell, I'm a professor of energy and environmental economics at Duke University, and I'm uh, now director of Duke's uh, university-wide energy initiative where we're, uh, it's a collaboration on energy education, research, and engagement. Uh, from 2009 to 2011, I was the administrator of the U.S. Energy Information Administration, which is the U.S. government agency that's charged with uh, all energy statistics and analysis for the, you know, all aspects of government as well as the private sector and the, and the, and the public sector. Um, I've also served on the President's Council of Economic Advisors as the Senior Economist for Energy and Environment. My, my research and outreach uh, historically, much of which has been, both, it's been mainly in the university setting and in, in Washington, D.C. and in policy circles, a lot of that has sur surrounded uh, issues such as market-based environmental policy, uh, the design of national and global climate policy, uh, policies and uh, related to energy efficiency, and energy technological change. And so the way I've approached that is by thinking about the different roles that uh, market forces play, that the private sector plays, that policy plays, that we as individuals play um, in the current and, and future energy system. And I'm happy to be part of this panel because anytime I can be part of a conversation about energy which is reasonable and uh, you know hopes to be rational, um, I'm happy to be a party to that. Okay, we still have to demonstrate that, but that's certainly our objective. Uh, now we're going to hear from Greg Kallenberg, and Greg, introduce your film. Sure. Um, I want to start by saying that, that Richard sold himself way short. He is an energy stud. <laughs> I kid you not. Um, my name is Gregory Kallenberg. I'm the director and one of the producers of the Rational Middle Energy Series. Um, a really short history of the way this came about is um, I did a film called Hainesville. It played last year at the Aspen Ideas Festival. Raise your hand if um, you saw it. Awesome. I can't see the audience. I'm assuming you all have your hands up. That's awesome. <laughs> um, and uh, basically, uh, as we were traveling Hainesville around, um, we saw that most of the people who would come to the films seemed to have um, a lot of in common with each other. And one of the things that they had in common was they didn't know a lot about energy. People not only didn't know a lot about energy, is they also felt like the energy sector or the energy discussion had become incredibly polarized. That it sort of had become people standing across from each other. And in sitting across from each other, they were heaving insults and not sort of moving towards a clean energy solution or a solution to get us closer towards an energy future. Um, I was invited to speak at TED in Austin and spoke about this audience and um, fortunately or unfortunately, Austin makes you put a name to everything, or TED does, and we came up with this name, The Rational Middle. And The Rational Middle, to me, is this group of all of us who don't necessarily stand behind barricades at the extreme sides, but understand that energy is a complicated issue and it's something we have to work on together. Um, for about a year and a half, um, we stumped around for funding on this idea. Um, uh, people were very excited and very supportive, but in writing checks, we, were, we couldn't really find anyone. And um, last year, we played Haynesville, and we were fortunate enough to meet Shell. Now, um, our involvement with Shell came with some caveats from us, because while we definitely had this trepidation to uh, work with a large energy company, um, and th they probably had a trepidation working with me, but I hope Russ doesn't talk about that. But, um, I'll, but I'll ask him later. Okay, good, good. Um, but, uh, but, you know, the idea was we wanted full informational, editorial, and creative control over the films themselves. We wanted these films to be tonal. We wanted them to be cinematic. We wanted them to teach people about energy. We wanted to lay down a foundation because my belief is once we lay down a foundation, basically a playbook that we can all speak off of, then we could start working towards an energy solution. And my hope is, is that my films are balanced. They include energy studs like Richard. And they speak to the issue of energy. And they will in turn get us all talking and moving towards an agreement that we have to move towards a clean energy future. 
So this first film we're going to see is called What's at Stake? Um, it's looking at the current energy situation in the United States. Um, and I look forward to sharing it with you. This is actually the premiere of it right here at the Aspen Ideas Festival. So thank you so much for being here. And um, I guess um, they're going to bring down a screen and we're going to have to leave. But um, this is going to be very, very Broadway-esque. I feel like we should do something. But yes, sing. America was founded based on an abundance of land, an abundance of space, an abundance of opportunity, an abundance of social mobility, and when it came time, an abundance of energy. Energy is an essential input into our quality of life. It's an essential input into our economy. How do we meet those growing energy demands while at the same time meeting some other key challenges? The environmental challenge, addressing the security issues that surround energy. The problem here in the United States is that people don't know where energy comes from. We want to flip on our light switches, we want to turn the ignition in our automobiles, and we want to use energy without understanding the consequences. We import a huge amount of our oil from other nations, and that relates to energy security because we don't have control over that oil. There have only been these very few times, times of national emergency, that we've ever really ever thought about our energy supply. So, so what are those times? 1973 oil crisis, we had to get in line. The gas wasn't there. There were even days and odd days when you could go. There were long lines. America truly was held hostage. The economy was brought to its knees. Another example more recent is uh, what happened in, say, 2007 and 2008 when the price of oil went from about uh, $70 uh, up to about $148. We're not on a path where we choose our own destiny in petroleum, and in fact, many of the regimes and countries that control that petroleum are not friendly to this nation. The only choice we can make is to move ourselves away from oil. All energy sources have costs associated with them. Those costs come in different forms. There's the costs that come with dollar signs attached to them. You know, how much we pay for gasoline at the pump, how much we pay for our electricity. There's the costs that don't have dollar signs attached to them. Those tend to be environmental costs. It's virtually incontrovertible that the climate is warming. The evidence is so profound and so comprehensive that that really is not a discussion. The big question that people still debate is how much warmer and what will the consequences be for people. We know a lot more than we did even a decade or two ago, but there's always going to be uncertainty remaining. We put stuff into the atmosphere, whether it's the traditional pollutants or carbon dioxide, without recognizing that on some level, some generation in the future is going to have to pay for that, if not our generation. At least currently in the United States, we don't have a comprehensive climate policy. So while there is a cost to emitting ca carbon dioxide emissions and a cost to emitting greenhouse gas emissions in the form of increased risk of global climate change, we don't face that economic cost directly. I don't believe that we will, you know, have one apocalyptic day. I think we will gradually erode our quality of life and the security of our economic well-being until something happens that really shocks the system. Then I think we will act. But the question is that how deep is the hole we've dug before we have to climb back out of it? It's really about the profound impacts that we are having now, seven billion people, the doubling of the need of energy on this planet over the course of the next few decades, the doubling of the need that we're gonna to have to produce food to feed a growing population. This is not just about some kind of blind, feel-good sort of thing. This is about where we're going globally with more people living more prosperous lives, trying to do more things. The pressure is on and we have to produce more with less consequence 
not just because of climate change, but because of planet change. There's a responsibility there in terms of making sure that whatever it is that you're doing to produce energy, whether it's drilling oil and gas wells, mining coal, using wind power, using solar, whatever it is that you're doing has an environmental consequence. And the goal ought to be to minimize the environmental impact. But at the end of the day, a lot of this is really on my shoulders and your shoulders, because we are ultimately the consumers of the energy. But for some reason, we don't understand that. We grow accustomed to having relatively uh, readily available supply. And when you think about all that, you become aware of why we feel the way we feel about energy. It's always been there. We have this, you know, great possibility of having, you know, cheaper electricity and, and the ability to sustain our economy and our economic growth with resources that are produced right here in the United States. If we could address the environmental challenges while simultaneously doing so in a way that people think is economically affordable, is politically feasible, and also addresses energy security concerns, that's where the solutions lie. If we put our mind to it, the whole energy infrastructure that we have today could be completely changed into a low carbon energy future just through technology. We are now starting to see some of these technologies mature on a commercial level. And investors are comfortable enough now with these technologies that investment in renewables has surpassed fossil fuels for the first time in 2011. At the moment, those energies like wind and solar are more expensive than hydrocarbons. And we will develop technology as we go along which will make these, these sources of energy more efficient and cheaper. We need to take a very measured approach. We need to understand that winding down our dependence on fossil fuel is not something that's going to happen overnight, but it's going to take place over decades. These are true 21st century globalized issues, problems, challenges that we now confront that require 21st century globalized solutions. The question is whether that will be our priority or not, and that's the challenge. has been revealed and uh, I'll reintroduce myself because people sitting next to me said I did a bad job of that. Uh, so my name is Kvetia Freeland. I'm the editor of Thomson Reuters Digital. Um, okay, so Richard, you have been introduced to us as an energy stud. Is that yes. on your business card? It's not, uh, but I'll, I've already ordered new ones. <laughs> uh, and uh, you were sort of quoted extensively in that film. Um, I felt that you were setting us up there a little bit, because there was one line maybe setting us up for the next episode where you said, you know, if we can find a solution which is affordable and good for the environment and works politically, then that will be the solution. So do you know the answer? Uh, the answer is not easy, I'll be honest with you. Um, and I, I, I put out that multifaceted uh, part of it because, you know, one of the things that came up in the film was that, you know, we have technologies. Uh, that can significantly reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions and meet other challenges. And that's true, uh, but we also face differences in cost of different technologies. And so the challenge there then arises, you need to think about the availability of technologies in conjunction with what the relative costs are in the marketplace. Um, so a solution along those, that dimension, um, innovation is very important. Innovation plays one role in terms of bringing down the cost of technologies so that renewable energy technologies low emission technologies can be more competitive, energy efficiency can be uh, more competitive, uh, but I don't think that that's enough actually, unless you think that you can get renewable energy cheaper than coal, 
um, and renewable and you know, advanced biofuels cheaper than oil, uh, then you're going to need something else that is going to be directing the system. That's where uh, policy tends to come into play. And when there's policy, there's politics. And that's why I brought political feasibility into it. Um, right now, we're in a, uh, not just in energy, but quite broadly in our political system, we're in a very polarized situation, and energy is a part of that conversation. I try to maintain a level of uh, optimism. I try not to get too uh, caught up in the, the current moment that we're in, which is highly polarized. I, I, I think that we'll emerge from that. And then when we do emerge from that, I think the same kinds of conversations that were going on uh, before the economic downturn, which has led to a lot of this, uh, will reemerge. And the country was actually on the verge of moving toward comprehensive energy and climate policy. Um, many people thought that was actually likely. And I think that, you know, over time, will that kind of a compromise will reemerge. Alexis, do you share that confidence? Well, I mean, I think that what you're saying is, is very true. I mean, elements of that um, are definitely in RMI's perspective as well. But I think, um, you know, you have to start from the beginning, and from the, the, the best, easiest thing to do first, which is efficiency, generally. Energy efficiency in both buildings and vehicles, in, and even before you think about the buildings and vehicles, the way we lay out our communities and our um, transportation systems. And, um, you know, as Reinventing Fire outlines, we can actually keep our energy use in the United States anyway constant, between now and 2050, the, the amount, the total amount of energy that we need through this radical efficiency. That doesn't mean that it is easy. As you said, Richard, I mean, that, that is a lot of hard work. And, and that's the, the real challenge is that this is just a roadmap. This is a way to get there. But, um, you know, that means, for instance, you would have to, just to put this in perspective, retrofit 8,000 buildings a day. That's like one building per city, so, you know, 300 buildings in, in every city a year. I mean, that's doable, right? But it, you have to get it done. So then you have to start the transition. And um, doing that transition to, to get the renewables online is also not easy. I mean, that ha has a trajectory, and we think that, you know, between now and 2050, we can pretty much eliminate the fossil fuels again, except for some of the natural gas. But, you know, that is also um, something that uh, is complicated. I'd and like for us to ask there. you to pick up on mm -hmm. this point about renewables, and I'm mm -hmm. going to also bring in a point that Richard made, you know, this notion that renewables are only really going to become a big part of the economy when they are as cheap as fossil fuels, and it's going to take policy to make that happen. And I want to bring in sort of a pessimistic note to this conversation, well, also optimistic, by saying, Russ, maybe you and your colleagues are doing your job too well, and that we are actually uh, in an environment which makes, Greg, I'm sad to say, maybe your film even a little bit dated. Uh, and that point, uh, you know, the Bloomberg story, it should have been a Thomson Reuters story, uh, about how in 2011 investment in renewables was higher than fossil fuels. I wonder whether we're actually at sort of a pivot point where fossil fuels are coming back, huge natural gas discoveries in the United States. We're seeing now oil sands. We're seeing the Brazilian discoveries. And we're seeing it reflected in the price. I was at the end of last week at the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum. Shell representatives were there in force. And the big preoccupation there was not, are we running out of fossil fuels? The Russians are worried that there's too goddamn much of it on the market right now, and the prices are too low, and they were bitching about the excellence of the U.S. companies that are finding a lot of it. Uh, Gazprom, you know, the mighty Russian gas producer, is now saying, you know, Jesus Christ, the Americans have a lot of gas now. So I would like you, Russ, to comment on this and talk about what impact that's going to have on the politics. Because, you know, if we find that our fossil fuels are a lot cheaper and this economic pressure that we had really been worrying about, certainly up to 2008, you know, that, that pressure is gone. Aren't we going to forget about these issues for a while? Well, yeah, that, that is an interesting point. I mean, you know, renewables are a, a topic that, that are approached from a lot of different angles and what a lot of people don't think about is even integrated oil companies like Shell are involved in the renewable scene. I mean, we've invested billions of dollars in renewables over the last several years. 
with our biggest one being in, uh, in biofuels in Brazil, where we make biofuels from, from sugar cane. So that's our biggest re renewable resource. We're also in the wind business. Um, so I think we do have a perspective on economics, like you're talking about, and everybody in this room knows that, that economics do matter. I mean, our shareholders indulge us to the point that we make a competitive return for them. And if we're investing in businesses that don't make money, no matter whether they're fossil fuel businesses or renewable businesses, then we have to alter our behavior or we will not be in business for the long term. So um, while renewables are a portion of our, our business and we have made investments that do make money, we do have to have a balance, and I think that balance is also reflected in the mix that you see, if you want to call it an energy market, in that energy market. So renewables are roughly 10 percent of what, what, is, what is produced or what produces energy in, in the United States right now. And I'm, I'm personally a guy that I don't like sound bites as a rule, but I do believe in the all of the above strategy because I don't think renewables can get to a major portion of um, the supply of world demand by 2050 and completely displace fossil fuels. Okay, so Alexis is wrong. We're not going to be off fossil fuels in 2050. I think I think it's going to be a challenge. I think you're going to have. To, I think it, it it would have to have a growth that is unprecedented in any other energy development that we have ever seen. You take wood, coal, petroleum products of any kind. The growth rate that you have to have would be would be unprecedented. Now, in saying that, in saying that, I don't think that you, you alleviate the effort. I think you have to continue to try, but I think we also have to be very realistic and recognize that coal and natural gas, no matter where that natural gas is produced, from, from Russia to supply Europe or within our own borders, which has been a real economic change for this country, um, it's going to have to be produced to meet the energy demand of the population in 2050. We need efficiency. We need more supply, and if we continue on the rates that we've gotten both, we have an unsustainable gap that we will not be able to fill. So we're going to need the efficiency end, and we're going to need more resources, and it can't just be, it can't just be alternatives. And Russ, can you just educate us a little bit also on what's happening in the market? How important are these new discoveries we've seen, and, and not so much even new discoveries, but new techniques allowing us to get at that natural gas and oil more efficiently? Yeah, so if you talk if you talk the North American scene, and maybe this is even what your comment on Gazprom, what they're reacting to, I think uh, the technology and the supply has been probably one of the uh, most pivotal events that I've witnessed in my going on fourth decade in this business right now. I think about things that happened before and things that I remember. You know, one of the things that got me into this business was the embargo that was in the film we just watched in the 70s and realizing that, that, that energy was going to be something that was more than just a commodity that we could easily access. And then we had the, the abrupt change, you know, high oil prices down to low oil prices for a very long period of time. And now we've seen uh, a fuel that was once considered kind of the king of fuels because it was very difficult to get natural gas become plentiful in the environment that we're in. There's been a technology uh, evolution that's, re that's, that's allowed us to realize resources that we knew were there. We just didn't know how to economically, economically develop them. So horizontal drilling and, and yeah, hydraulic fracturing. And we can talk about that if you want to. But that's opened up an opportunity in, in, in our country right now to drive gas prices down actually below the cost of supply because supply is so abundant. You know, $2.50 over a long term, and some people believe it's going to last for a long time, I've got a little different view, is almost unprecedented. And that's going to drive fundamentally different demand behavior from power producers, from people that build vehicles that can run on natural gas, and from thinking like what my company does and converting that natural gas and the thermodynamic process to a liquid, you know, so we can use it as a fuel. So I think it's a, it's a change that's occurred in our continent that we're just at the beginning of understanding the benefits of. And so I'd like to just one last follow-up press on that we're just at the beginning point. Um, what do you think is the prospect that these new techniques are going to actually allow us, as in humanity, to tap into fossil fuel reserves in other parts of the world where they haven't been applied yet? Now, how much more is there there? So I'll, I'll try to put a boundary around the question a little bit. I think if you're talking um, um, some of the shale reserves of, of, of gas and oil, um, North America is way out at the forefront of what that supply looks like. Um, uh, China is actively involved in the development of their resources. Eastern Europe and the Ukraine are actively developed in, are actively involved in the development of their resources. One of the reasons you mentioned is for ex energy security, particularly with what happened last winter with Gazprom. It's hard to say if that's going to match up with what North America has. The geology is there, um, the will is there, and we'll just have to see if the resources are there. And what's your prediction? Yeah, I think that there's some places that are going to have an abundance of uh, resources. So go south of our borders into South America. Colombia, Argentina uh, show great promise. Um, unexplored promise in many areas, but, but great promise. I mean, exploration is a, is a probability of success game, huh? 
every time you drill a well in an exploration doesn't mean that you're going to find um, commercial resources. It's usually on average of 20 or 30 percent, so that appraisal has to be done. But the promise is there uh, in, in the places that I, that I, that I mentioned. Do you want to jump back I, in, Alexis? I just wanted to and I'm going to bring in Richard. So. Right. Sorry. <laughs> but I just wanted to add that this $2.50 you know, price per million BTU or per thousand cubic feet, as we <laughs> define it, these are you know, not the easiest terms to talk about, but that $2.50 is, is really the price today, but that has been a, an extremely volatile price over time. And to think that um, $2.50 is going to remain that way indefinitely or even over the next, you know, decade is um, not a very economically um, advantageous way to think about it because you can't hedge right now that cost and buy $2.50 um, gas on the market. So, so it's like, you know, if you were to buy a junk bond and think only about today's price and not about its volatility. Um, what, um, what, what you're talking about with regard to all of the other countries that are also developing their gas reserves also brings in the point that it's, right now it's a regional uh, market, uh, but with um, potential for liquid um, natural gas and, and uh, other methods, it, it will become a global market and then that will also affect the price as well as the you know, changes and fluctuations in demand as we ramp up our infrastructure for using natural gas. So it's definitely not automatically cheaper um, than some of the renewable technologies. If you consider the volatility and the risk associated with price fluctuation, then um, resources such as wind and solar become more economically and, and financially competitive. Um, if you factor those things in. So Richard, as our uh, declared energy stud, I'm going to ask you to weigh in on a couple of these issues that we have identified. First is 2050. Are we going to be off fossil fuels? Should we be? So I think an important question answered, uh, by we, I'm assuming you mean the United States. Sure. Uh, let's do, but I'm so Canadian. There's, okay, so, why so do the, you there's, the, there's, there's the United States, there's North America, there's the world. Um, I think it's highly unlikely that we will be off of fuels by 2050. Is it desirable? Some, uh, is it desirable? Okay. If that really depends on what unfolds over the next couple decades in terms of technological improvement. Uh, because one of the things that, and why, one of the reasons why I think having a conversation that's at the rational middle is that there are choices and there are trade-offs. If we had energy that, if, if the cheapest energy was also the most secure and reliable energy, and was also the cleanest energy, we wouldn't have a problem. The problem is that the cheapest energy isn't the cleanest energy. And that sometimes the cheapest sources aren't the most reliable sources. And so we face these challenges and trade-offs. One thing I want to say beh behind your original question, which is interesting, is um, I think sometimes there's a notion that the kind of peak, peak fossil fuels, peak oil or peak coal or peak gas, that this will somehow solve these challenges because you know, we'll naturally run out of the fossil fuels and the price will rise and we'll substitute to these other alternatives and that'll just kind of send in a natural uh, beneficial thing. Um, it's not going to happen. Um, what history has shown time and time again, there is a massive amount of hydrocarbons in the Earth's crust and technological improvements have demonstrated us again and again different ways to extract that. Um, shale gas, shale resources have always been there um, not always, but they've been there for a very long time. We just didn't have the technical, technological way to extract it in a commercial way. So uh, peak fossil fuels is not going to solve our problem in any event. What the recent situation so, so, has shown so, us... So are you saying, Richard, that actually, you know, this most important event in four decades of Russ's life in the energy industry actually is going to happen again in 20 years? Is our could very well happen. So if, if anybody's... Again in another 20? If, if anybody's tuned into, I, I even hesitate to use this example, if anybody's turned into the, the new version of Dallas, you know, the, the, the show that was on, one of the things in there is methane hydrates. All right, so methane hydrates are real. It, the guy, you see the son of JR, not JR, Bobby Ewing, has this, you know, blue crystal and it's flaming. That's real. That's real. The, the interesting twist in there is that they're, I think they're kind of melding that with the hydraulic fracturing thing and making people confused. But anyway, so there are a lot of things like that that people are doing research to develop, potentially develop methane hydrates. All I'm saying is that 
um, if we're going to simultaneously confront our environmental challenges as well as meeting our energy demands, um, we're going to have to confront those directly because technological improvement will show us new ways to extract, extract fossil fuels. One thing I will concur with Russ, with, with Russ, Russ said was the dramatic change in uh, natural gas, which is now applying, being applied to shale oil or tight oil, was unforeseen, really unforeseen. And so it actually has demonstrated how fast the energy system can sometimes change and how we have to be humble about how much we think we know about the future. Because less than a decade ago, the U.S. natural gas production was headed like this and imports were headed like this and prices were headed like this. Um, and that's totally flipped on its head in a very, sh le less than a decade, really five years. Um, one final point. Uh, so when I was at the Energy Information Administration, we did a preliminary, and I'm going to say preliminary in like big all caps with italics, um, assessment of world shale gas resources. Because once this started unfolding in the United States, people were asking, well, what about the rest of the world? Um, that, that showed huge potential shale gas resources globally. And then the question is, well, will they be commercial? Will countries have an incentive and a desire to actually extract them? And now we're seeing that unfold. There's now exploration going on in places like Poland, which may not be turning out as well as people had thought they were going to. There's countries like France who've decided they don't want to have anything to do with it, even though they, they appear to have significant shale gas resources. And then you have countries like China who are you know, massively growing faster than any other country in the world in terms of their energy consumption, are beholden to places like Russia, not necessarily their best friends, um, for their natural gas. And so you can see the incentives lying as well as the fact that they have shale gas. And so if I had to guess where you're going to see these kinds of things growing, it'd be places like China, where they need it, they want it, and they have it. Okay, and I especially uh, note and appreciate the point about how we need to be humble, even those of us who are university professors. It's not something we experience all that often. Um, I think that's a good point, Greg. I'm going to go to you. I'm going to ask you to make a few remarks on what you've heard and then introduce your next film, okay? Great. I, I just want to let everybody know that, that you heard it here first, Dallas, referenced by Richard Newell at the Aspen Ideas Festival. Um, yeah, I, I'd like to thank Richard. I was going to ask him about that. So, are you watching that for fun, or do you consider <laughs> I was it gonna part ask. of your I was going to wait. I was going to wait until the mic's part of, It's part of my job. Yeah, it's, it's part of your job. Yes. Okay. Um, if we take your classes, do we have to watch it? Do we get to watch it? No. <laughs> You're embarrassed. Um, but, you know, I, I do want to note that, that this is kind of, this is sort of my dream. This is what the, the rational middle is all about, is getting all these people here with differing opinions and getting them to discuss the issue and work through it. So this is a, a very exciting sort of development. Again, it's the first time we've done this and, and, and it's, going, it's going very well. The, uh, the next film we're going to see is a companion piece to What's at Stake. It's called The Great Transition. I hope Krista doesn't find this as dated as she might have found uh, What's at Stake. I know, I know. You tease because you love. Um, but uh, but uh, it's, it's basically kind of taking us to the next step, which is looking at some of these transitions to um, new energy systems, looking at, um, well, I'm not going to ruin it for you. I'll, please see it, and I look forward to hearing what you think afterwards. Our energy crossroads brings together energy security, national security, economic security, and environmental security. We need to change the way our economy is designed, the way we move around the country, the way we power our economy in a way that's sustainable for 200 years, not just for the next 20. We've got to get on with it. We've got to break the gridlock over this and move forward with the choices, trade-offs, technologies that are required. A clean energy future is a remarkable thing to think about, and, and it exists. It means doing less of the really dirty stuff and doing that first. It means doing more of the clean stuff, and that's using more natural gas in place of coal for now. It means using more renewable energies over time. Renewables have a huge potential, but we have to be realistic. I have to think about how am I going to transition to that 
at a massive scale. When you get into the discussions about wind and solar and things like that, you're talking about, you know, on the order of one and a half to two percent of the total energy mix, which leaves you sitting there scratching your head thinking, wow, we've got a lot of room uh, to really sort of increase that, that renewable footprint. The issue with renewables, and they're, the reason they're really unable to take the place in our power generation of these other sources, is they're transient. They only generate power when the sun's shining or the wind blows, etc. The intermittency issue is enormous for renewable energy technologies. So while renewables are theoretically limitless, they are not there all the time. So you have to have backup, or you have to have ways of managing the intermittency of wind or solar. So sort of the holy grail in the electricity market would be, you know, commercial scale battery technology. If you had that, then all these issues about intermittency go away. Well, one thing you could do is put fast acting natural gas backups online, whereas the wind dies down or the solar dies down, you ramp up your natural gas in response. So natural gas is really a great partner for renewables because the variability of renewables matches well with the fast response time of natural gas. For moderate emission reductions, natural gas can play a very important role. So you can get 50% reductions in your emissions relative to coal through natural gas. So right away, if you think of a transition where you have targets that are 50% or so, you can do that through natural gas. But still is producing greenhouse gases, still is contributing to the warming of the earth, and we are going to make an eventual pivot away from these sources of energy so that we really address global warming, we're going to have to move past natural gas too. So that gives you a sense of some of the challenges we face, but it means that we need to take a comprehensive approach. It means that you have to be patient, but at the same time it means that if you don't start the ball rolling in a particular direction, you'll never make any progress. We have to develop the technology, we have to sort of have a plan. Long-term R&D effort, like President Kennedy, we're going to the moon, you know, we're going to solve this energy problem, here's how we're going to do it, right? We need to be realistic that we're going to use fossil fuels now, because in the end, we are. So right now, in our two to five year plan, our focus needs to be on energy efficiency and conservation. Government has to regulate standards of energy efficiency right across the board from cars through appliances to homes. The more difficult part is on the supply side where we need more renewable energies and we need to make that work with our existing fossil fuels and we need to change our networks in order to make that happen. What is at the other end of that transition? Where, where are we going? Where we're going, you hope, is a, a, an energy, a clean energy future where renewables are cheap and highly efficient, where dispersed power, solar, wind, can be driving communities, not just single homes, where nuclear power or natural gas or something on that scale is humming cleanly and cheaply. So that bridge needs to be strong and needs to be serious and needs to be better than what we were doing before. So then we think about how do you move from those greenhouse gas intensive fuels toward a system that's a lower carbon economy. You have to think about the fact that the installed infrastructure for this energy system has been put in place over many, many decades. It's trillions and trillions of dollars. It takes time to turn over that infrastructure. When you look at the enormous amount of investments that have been poured into this sector globally, those investors are telling us that they believe these technologies are the future, that they can make money, and that they are the most important business drivers in the energy sector today. I also think a clean energy future is a future where we're using options for, for energy that we don't talk about yet. Where we've allowed innovation and people who are, who are driven by their own self-interest to invent new and different ways to power our economy. If those technologies include electricity storage, then renewable energy could play even a larger part because then you could store the electricity that comes from the wind or the sun and use it when the wind wasn't blowing and the sun isn't shining. This is something that's achievable over the time frame of several decades. So we're talking about a goal that you might put in place by the year 2050.
but it's one that delivers payoffs much sooner than that. There are steps we take, we become somewhat less vulnerable over time. But in the end, if you want to get to a system that is not putting out carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that's not dependent on global oil markets, that is a very long time off in the future. You know, in spite of everything, I'm optimistic. Think about 20 or 30 years ago. The world was incredibly different. The technologies were incredibly different. That will happen again. We just need to make sure that that change is directed at transitioning ourselves from a fossil fuel dependent economy to a low carbon economy, and it'll happen. It is important to recognize that we are all joined here by a common future and that we need to work together to make it a, a better situation for all of us. It certainly is within our power it may take some initial sacrifices and patience, in other words, I mean a long-term holistic perspective, but I believe that with sound policy, supported by technology and uh, essentially uh, political will, we can certainly create a better future for our descendants. I think our mics are up. Yes? Okay. Uh, thank you, Greg, for another great film. Uh, now, I had the impression as I was watching it uh, that if fuels could be depicted as cartoon characters, uh, the superhero with the six pack and the cape would have been natural gas. Uh, and that, you know, the idea was this is going to be the fuel that is our transition from bad, dirty fossil fuels we're using a lot today to good, lovely renewables, cue the music and the people planting trees. Um, Richard, do you really see natural gas as a, a, an essential, you know, transition fuel? How, how, how important is it? How much should we be thinking about it? We've heard from Russ that there's a lot more of it than we thought. Yeah. Uh, so I, th I think the points that uh, I saw made in the film was one, uh, recognizing certain advantages that natural gas has over other fuels, uh, but then also rec recognizing that natural gas is not a zero emission and totally environmentally benign fuel. So um, like so many of the things in this area, it's kind of in the middle. Um, and so you have to uh, think about it in context. So I guess what I would say is um, natural gas is, the reality is natural gas for electric power is already beating everything else. Um, the, in the United States, even without further climate policy, um, there's no plans to build any new coal plants in the United States, other than a, a handful that are already under construction. Um, there's a couple reasons for that. Uh, one reason is well, low natural gas prices have reinforced that because it's simply coal is just not as profitable. And then there's the looming, there's you know, certain environmental regulations that have been put in place. But coal seems to be um, at least stagnant and maybe on its way down. Uh, as Tim Perfetta, who spoke in the film, pointed out, though, natural gas does not have zero emissions, right? And so if you're going to, over the long term, want to stabilize greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere, not let them go up any further, you at some point can't be emitting any more of those emissions. Uh, so depending upon how stringent your target is for those concentrations is going to depend on how long you think you can continue to use fuels like coal and natural gas and how soon you think you need to phase them out. Now, one thing that I, I don't think has come out yet in the conversation is um, there, the, the tenor has been kind of our current situation then, then moving away or phasing out fossil fuels. Uh, a question that's still um, up for debate is something called carbon capture and storage. Now, carbon capture and storage is a technology where you 
burn fossil fuels, carbon dioxide emission is produced in that combustion process, but you capture those greenhouse gas emissions and you do something with it so that it doesn't enter into the atmosphere. Um, you potentially uh, put it underground or there's other techniques that people are developing that you could maybe turn into a solid. So a question um, is what role will carbon capture and storage play in a future? And if that plays a future in a more carbon constrained world, you could continue to have use of natural gas for a very long time. Um, while addressing, like we do in so many other ways, through end-of-the-pipe technologies, the environmental consequences of these fuels. Okay, Richard, I want you to answer your own question. Is carbon sequestration going to be sort of the have-your-cake-and-eat-it-too technology that allows us to enjoy the fabulous convenience of fossil fuels without wrecking the planet? Well, so there's, the, it, it, the, so there's different um, environmental consequences of energy production and use. So the combustion part... I was looking for a yes or no. I was uh, yeah, sorry. Um, on the, there's, there's environmental consequences on the production side that carbon capture and storage does not solve, right? So depending upon, uh, you need to deal with those as well. And I don't want to dismiss those. So you could, you could uh, you know, capture all the carbon that coals out of a coal plant and still have mountaintop mining. And you obviously haven't solved that part of the problem. So uh, I guess I'll leave it at that. Okay, Alexis? Well, I was going to say too, I mean, we're just assuming that the natural gas is, is getting to the natural gas, you know, uh, power plant without emissions too. And there's a, there is a range of how it gets there. And there is a potential of emissions at the source as well. And we know that natural gas, which is primarily methane, is 20, 25 times more uh, strong a um, uh, gas, a uh, greenhouse gas, than CO2. So if you have a, an operation at the site, a production well, that's emitting, you know, four to six percent um, emissions of methane leaking in, in, and this can happen because uh, there are a lot of um, natural gas uh, operations that range from um, ones that are very carefully controlled and environmental um, considerations are best practice and they're, they're doing a pretty good job to ones that are not on that same level and there isn't a federal standard to regulate it all, you know, federally. So if you're emitting 4 to 6 percent, then you're all of a sudden kind of at the same level of other fossil fuels in terms of your overall but emission. You're as bad as coal? You're Natural as bad gas as, can be as bad you, as coal? You could be as bad as Prettier, coal because remember, 20 times more um, greenhouse gas emissions per, uh, per you know, unit. So if, you, if you're emitting more than that 6%. Okay, Richard gets a quick <coughs> retort. Sorry, I'll, I'll, I have to wait into this. So just so everybody... So, um, the, the, the point I made in the film, which was that in combustion, uh, natural gas has 50% of the carbon dioxide emissions of coal. I think you'd probably, you're assuming that in your background. But then the question is, carbon dioxide is well, only one greenhouse gas emission. Right. It's methane itself, natural gas, is a greenhouse gas. And so if you're injecting methane directly into the atmosphere, it's a potent greenhouse gas. It doesn't last for very long. It tends to disappear from the atmosphere much quicker than carbon dioxide emissions. Um, and so there's a trade-off there in terms of weighing the overall greenhouse gas impact. So there's been some recent studies. Um, there was a recent uh, paper, including from Bill Shemides, the dean of the school of which I'm a faculty member, who you also saw in the film, um, that recently came out that uh, showed that taking into, con into consideration the recent evidence that natural gas, in terms of its greenhouse gas influence, is still better than coal. The thing that, um, the reason I, I wanted to weigh in on this is that I think we run a danger of um, not just confusing people, but also losing track of the, the, the big game here. Uh, coal and CO2 emissions last in the atmosphere for hundreds of years. Um, and it's very difficult to get a hold of that because it's a natural consequence of the co combustion process. Methane very potent, disappears in a decade or so. Okay, so over the timescales over which we're dealing with climate change, I'm at least quite confident that we can deal with leaks at, um, at natural gas sites. It's just a much easier technical problem. I don't want to dismiss it as an issue, but it's one that I think that we can get our, our hands around quite quickly. So I don't want people to get the sense that natural gas is worse than coal for the climate because I think that that would send us potentially policy-wise and market-wise in, in, in a bad direction. Okay, I'm going to ask 
Alexis to respond to that and oh. ask her one additional comment. Hang on, and then I'm going to bring Russ in, so get ready. Um, so Alexis, I'd like to hear your response to that. And also, fracking. I mean, come on. This is one of the new environmental horrors, according to many environmentalists. So I just want, I, I want to agree that, you know, natural gas is this great transition. It has all these benefits. It is, you know, depending on how efficient your natural gas power plant is, you know, and, and how efficient your coal plant it is, you know, 40 to 50 percent better. But we mustn't just say, oh, it's a cure-all. We do have to have the environmental regulations on those production operations to, to make it so, you know, to make it as, as effective uh, for... Um, this transition toward a, a, a low carbon future. Um, secondly, we need the same kind of stringency with, with environmental uh, regulations and standard best practices for water issues with fracking. I mean, that's the big, um, other big concern is water concerns. And again, I think it, it can be done well and we can avoid these, um, you know, real environmental concerns, but it's also being in, in some operations, and there are a lot of, you know, mom and pop operations or just for, uh, operations that don't have the standards where it's not being doing well, and that's what you hear about, you know, when you hear all of these horror stories. So, Alexis, bottom line, you seem like a very committed, planet-loving person. What's your lesser evil on the fossil fuel front? Oh, the lesser evil is, is clearly natural gas to transition. I mean, we have to get off of coal right away, you know, as soon as possible tra to transition. But even natural gas is, as the film pointed out, not the ultimate solution. It's not going to get us to the um, intergovernmental panel on climate change, you know, 80% reduction because it's only, you know, 40% reduction or maybe 50 um, we have to tr do that transition, and it's a, you know, it's a, it's a transitional fuel. Okay, Russ, I'd like to ask you to comment and also to speak about one other point we haven't really addressed but that the film touched on, which is if we buy the idea, you know, our fossil fuel superhero is natural gas, how much of an infrastructure do we have to build to use a lot more of it? I mean, the great thing about oil is it's really easy to use, it's really easy to transport. Everything that we have and use and love is designed to burn oil. Natural gas is a lot more complicated. Doesn't it cost a lot? No, it's, well, actually, l let's go to the first part because it may surprise you, not surprise you to um, know that I do agree with Richard. It probably would surprise you to know that I do agree with Alexis also because I do think we're getting to the interesting part here and this is kind of why I come to the show. Um, so gas is a good fuel. Let's just, let's just say that's the case right now. But, but there is an issue here. Um, it's development on, on the continent, on onshore, it's disruptive. Let's just face that. It's, it's disruptive. But it can be done in a very responsible manner. And I think part of the way that it can be done in a responsible manner is having the right regulation. Uh, I'm not afraid of regulation. I tell people that all the time, and sometimes folks are taken aback. So if regulation is a good thing. It continues to raise the bar on how producers, and, you know, by the way, in producers in North America, there's thousands of producers that can play this game, huh? You know, you got the capital, you can get into this business. Regulation is a good thing if we continue to raise the bar. But there's, there's a caveat there, too. I personally don't, pref don't like to be regulated by five different entities that all have different objectives. That's economic waste. I don't like to be regulated by people who change their mind from year to year to year. That's economic waste. There's a right way to do this, and the right way you do this, I think, is what Gregory has his arms around. I'll let, I guess I should let him talk about it because that's the house he lives in versus the house I live in. I want to talk to people about what that right regulation can be. Not from the standpoint that they have all the right answers or that the industry has all the right answers, but if we open the debate on hydraulic fracturing and the proper regulation of hydraulic fracturing in what you can do for methane emissions, I don't want to put methane in, into the air. I want to sell methane. I mean, that's the wrong thing for me to do. That's the wrong business model to let it emit. But if we emit at a particular place, it's a very tractable problem to be able to figure out how to do it better. And there's some companies, a shell amongst them, that are working with a consortium that involves the University of Texas and a data gathering company and one of the NGOs that you've all heard about to take measurements along the production process. Find out if there's places that are the higher leverage points that we're not exploring and go in and address those. That's the debate that I think we want to have and that, that's what makes things interesting here. And it gets to that rational middle. You want to have that debate with people that are really genuinely concerned with moving, their ball, moving the ball. What are the specific issues that you're most 
concerned about that, that you want the discussion to be around? Standards for fracking? Is that, is uh, that your biggie? Yeah, actually, no, not standards for fracking, because I think fracking is an absolute red herring. It's a technology that has enabled things, but hydraulic fracturing in and of itself can't contaminate a, hydro a, a water source. The real discussion has to be around wellbore construction. You construct a wellbore in the right way, hydraulic fracturing is never an issue. So what I want to do is get to the point where we have a discussion around the real issues that are going to make a difference in the way that you develop hydraulic. I'm just looking for what your real so this particular are. case, well, well, bore, well, bore well bore construction uh, design and construction, always good. We are regulated as an industry, by the way. I mean, and we work with states to develop that industry. Emissions are another great thing, but it's working with the right people and the people that, that Gregory's trying to get engaged in the debate that I think makes the difference. Your issue on transportation, I'll just answer it quickly, not an issue with natural gas. The transportation infrastructure is there. What we will build that's new is to en enlarge the demand of it, maybe to transportation fuel rather than Okay, talk about that. Talk about that? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, so if you and I owned an 18-wheeler fleet, you know, tractor trailers that did nothing but go down an interstate between one point and another point, we'd be looking at converting our diesel-driven truck to natural gas if we knew that at 2 in the morning we could stop at a particular station and refuel it. So I think the distribution network is going to have to evolve there. Um, we're involved with um, Travel Centers of America to put in in 100 of their stations, we haven't determined the locations yet, but 200 refueling lanes for LNG, liquefied natural gas. Take natural gas out of the ground, you super cool it to minus 160 degrees Celsius, you, you, you shrink the density of it by, by like 600 times, and then you put, it, you, you, you put it in a distribution system that can go into a truck. Do you need or do you want government to give a nudge to that kind of development? Do you want governments to be taking decisions like our transport vehicles will be using liquid natural gas, or is it going to happen naturally, in your view? Uh, so, so I'm, Richard's probably better at answering that than I am. But my my personal view is, if there's no if there's no long term economic incentive to do it, um, it's very difficult, and you can't see your way to get to a long term economic incentive to do it. Any amount of government intervention is not going to get you there. I think the laws of supply and demand have to dictate that, and if the laws of supply and demand are there and it's economic for you and I to convert our 18-wheeler to, to natural gas, someone will build it and we will come. Okay, as it happens, my uncle owns a fleet of 18-wheelers, so we'll talk about this afterwards. Um, I'm going to ask these guys questions for another maybe four or five minutes and then give everyone else a shot, so please get your questions ready. Um, so Richard, Russ's point right now, in some ways, very politely and nicely, and uh, actually uh, goes strongly against what you were saying to us a little bit earlier. Um, so your sort of perspective was actually to make this transition to sort of deal with the combination of, you know, climate change issues plus unpredictability of where our fuel sources are. Actually, we're going to need some concerted government policy. We're going to need an idea. We're going to need a plan. Price alone, market forces alone are not going to get us there. Who's so, right? Well, I don't, I don't know if... Uh Russ would disagree with me or not, because I, I think it depends on what policy you're talking about, right? So there's different kinds of policies. There's, I was trying to stimulate it. Yeah, no, I, I understand. Um, so there's what I call kind of technology pinprick policies, right? So we incentivize natural gas in trucks, and we um, have, you know, a hybrid vehicle, you know, $1,000 tax credit, and we um, have a renewable portfolio standard, you know, for a certain share of electricity. Um, these, there's been many of these policies used. They, they can have an impact, but they do not have an impact on the scale and in the manner which would lead to an effective and an efficient transition. Because there's too many other forces if you take this like a piece at a time, right? So we take, all right, so we maybe we subsidize the price of natural gas at the pump. That's not even necessary now because the price of gas is so cheap, but there's still legislation to propose doing that kind of stuff. Um, we could just give so, it away. So, so, that's a po so there's a difference between supporting the, what I think of as kind of piecemeal policies, kind of nipping away at the edges, versus something that's more comprehensive and can direct the system in a, in a, in a, in a, in a more effective, efficient direction. Um, I'll just say one thing on the, uh, the issue that did come up related to um, you know, natural gas and other uh, oil and gas production has to do with the local air quality. Um, and that is something that uh, required some... Uh, standards, I think, and where EPA has actually just put those into place. And so uh, these issues, as they arise, um, you know, I, I think it takes time to get them dealt with, but, um, you know, I guess I'm confident that we are, are, are dealing with them and, and can deal with them, I hope. 
I want to push you just once more on this comprehensive policy idea, and then as soon as I'm done that and you've answered, we'll take questions, so please prepare. Um, so comprehensive policy, it sounds so great, especially in a place like Aspen, where everyone is very smart and collectively belongs to the rational middle, and we think that if we were in a room together, we would come up with the ideal policies. But you have warned us already about the importance of humility, how we can't actually predict. We're very bad. We, we, we just experienced that we're bad at predicting which fuels are going to be out there. And maybe even we're bad at knowing which renewable sources of energy are going to be that great. Ethanol nowadays doesn't feel so wonderful to a lot of people. So what gives you the confidence that this is such a good idea, that we're going to be so good at coming up with some kind of comprehensive master plan? Isn't, isn't Russ right when he says market forces? Uh, market forces are incredibly important and, and I would concur that unless you are able to steer the market forces in a direction that aligns also with social desires, with our broader public desires, then you are doomed to failure because the energy system is in the hands of the private sector. The vast majority of research, development and innovation is in the hands of the private sector. It's almost all in the hands of the private sector and so unless you're steering the private sector in a reasonable way, you're going to fail. Um, so the reason I'm worried the, the, about how, how can we be conscious? How can we we know what's so, reasonable so, for right. this so let me. So the reason a comprehensive policy can work, and let me, let me be clear about what I mean by that, and um, I, I'm quite careful not to advocate particular things because my role in this is an analyst, but time and time again, um, analysts from a wide variety of areas who have analyzed the issue, particularly of greenhouse gas and carbon dioxide emissions, find that the most cost-effective, meaning get the biggest bang for your buck, because it does cost money, way to go about this is by putting some kind of a value on greenhouse gas emissions. And whatever the most effective, technologically effective, market effective way to do that, that can make a difference, that's what gets chosen. So it's actually resilient against what you're talking about. You don't, I don't need to bet on solar PV versus wind versus geothermal versus nuclear power versus natural gas with a 50% you know, hit, you know, credit. Um, you put in place a broad-based policy which provides incentive for reducing the thing you care about, in this case, greenhouse gas emission. If the other thing you care about, there may be other emissions you care about. You put it where you care, not in an indirect fashion, and that's, as, that's as, why it can work. Yeah, very convincing. Um, as part of that, would you also just raise taxes directly on fossil fuel consumption? I mean, one of the striking things about the United States is how low the price of gas is here compared to, say, Europe. So there's different techniques for putting value on greenhouse gas emission reductions, right? So there's a number of different ones. So one that has... You would hide it more? What's that? You would hide it more from voters? Maybe? Well, so there's different... So we could talk about different ways of hiding it, and there's, you know, you know, regulatory standards are usually the most effective way to not make it clear because it, it shows up in very indirect ways. Okay, the most clear way is, is a carbon tax. It's like, it, it's so obvious, um, you know, it's, and it's a dollar per ton type thing. But the methods are, you know, a carbon tax is one thing people talk about. It hasn't had a lot of politi le political legs. Uh, a cap and trade system for greenhouse gas emissions um, it's definitely had the, the strongest uh, push over the last several years, but was heavily damaged politically, and I think through the economic downturn, a, a, a increased mistrust of markets as an instrument for uh, many different things. Um, there's other proposals. The Obama administration proposed a clean electricity standard, a clean energy standard, which would say that a certain share of our electricity needed to come from, uh, you know, uh, clean energy. So these are all different mechanisms that, that could potentially be used. Okay, Alexis wants to say one thing, and then we'll go to questions, so get ready. I don't know if there are mics here around. Yes, people are ready with mics, so Alexis. Well, I just wanted to add that, that um, you know, gas uh, also has the advantage of being able to depreciate its, its reservoir as a capital asset, which is, is in effect a subsidy of gas. It also, if we don't have stricter and more standardized regulations, then, then operations that are not putting those in place, which add about 8% to the cost of uh, developing the gas, so if you really are doing best practice, you, you'd be 8% more costly. Those are also additional factors that, um, that are reducing the price of gas relative to other sources. And then the other thing I wanted to add is that in addition to the ability to, to have um, carbon uh, taxes or pricing of some sort, um, a, a distributed renewable future has a lot of other benefits such as resilience, 
such as the ability if it's distributed um, where you know you have solar panels on your home and, and small wind farms and other sources um, that those sources could island so if the grid went down over here you could still get power over here it cuts down your transmission losses if you can distribute those resources it's also much less vulnerable to attack from uh, foreign uh, or you know any terrorist or even a local terrorist um, there are a lot of other benefits to transitioning to this renewable future in addition to the carbon benefit that um, have a lot of value in, in our economy as well as in our society. Okay, you, you know, question, you know, we're, Greg? We're, I just wanted to add one thing, and you, we were talking about policy, and um, you know, when you look at sort of what we're trying to do with the Rational Middle film series, I mean, it is about education and energizing and activating people to talk like it's being talked about up here. And one of the things I found as I was traveling around Haynesville and we were developing this idea of the Rational Middle is that a lot of these issues, while we have very smart people up here, they haven't really gotten to the policymakers. That that a lot of sort of the the basic information that's out there that's just just being communicated up here is not being sort of absorbed and then being turned into policy. So, I guess it's my way of saying that there's a step we're kind of going over, which is actually showing the policymakers about energy, the energy future, about some of the things that were talked about in the film. I actually didn't think natural gas was the hero of it. I thought it was more of a trio of efficiency, of natural gas being maybe one of them. And also, I think that, that future technologies is something that is incredibly exciting. And if you look at what we're going to try to do with the rational middle, is we're going to try to sort of extend the series to where we can look at all these issues. Because it's a great way to communicate. And again, we talk at such a high level here. Once you get talking to an actual policymaker, um, they, their, their understanding is a lot more base than this. Russ, do you agree with this? You yeah. think policymakers, policymakers around energy are more ignorant than this uh, I didn't sort say, of I didn't one say hour ignorant. long panel I didn't, I didn't, discussion? I, 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 you also, think, you I, said they I, don't I, have the information. I said, I said, I said a lot of time they, they're, 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 uh, they are underinformed. I mean, Even you, relative to just us after watching two seven-minute films? Well, no, no. I'm saying that the policymakers out there who are in Washington thinking about policy right now. I mean, I think that there are a lot of issues out there that, that I mean, ask everyone up here what it's like to communicate okay, I with ask, I, want, I want to ask Russ, and if this is the case, your lobbyists are clearly not doing a very good job. Well, you know, you can't put everybody into one bucket. There's clearly people that are very informed on energy issues. But, but I think with the, with the challenge we face, we need to broaden that base considerably. And more importantly, the people that make the policy are elected by other people. So to be able to get them interested, sometimes you need to get the constituents interested, which is why I think Gregory's got a powerful mechanism here to get, get in information transferred to people that can really make the difference. You make information available, you get everybody more um, up to speed on what the real issues are in the energy challenge, there's going to be more interest here. You know, $5 gallon gasoline gets people intensely interested. $3.50, not so much. Well, there's going to be movements in prices over the long period of time, just like we've seen in the past. We need to get the publics engaged. That's what the rational middle does, I think, and it gets policymakers engaged when the public is. Okay, questions. Wow. <laughs> See, you guys got people very engaged. Okay, I'm going to take three questions at a time because there are so many. So the mic here, here, and here. And please do a favor to everybody else who is here and introduce yourself, say who you would like to answer the question, and just one question, please. Well, Zeno and Aspen, uh, for us, we've spoken, in terms of greenhouse gases, we're spoken only about domestic policy. Uh, if we should look to China, and you spoke about no coal-fired plants being built in the United States, but what is happening in China? And is that going to dominate the greenhouse gas circumstance going forward? Do you, as a company, um, interact with the international market in trying to promote these restrictions? Okay, great, so, thank you. We'll, we'll, t we'll take two more, Russ, just so we can get more voices in there. Thank you. Hi, uh, my question, I'm kind of free to start from the Atlantic, and my question is uh, Im implicit in the notion of a rational middle uh, that we should be focused on uh, are that there are these irrational ideas at the fringes, these pernicious ideas uh, th that we ought to uh, bat down that, that are, are harming this process of moving forward, and I just wanted to know what are those specific ideas? And who's that question to? Um, I, I suppose um, 
who, who got the last question? I'll, I'll space things out so that. I, I uh, got, Russ the, last got the last one. Uh, and I'm sorry, Richard. Gre Gregory. Richard. Uh, uh, Richard, no. Richard, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, um, I believe that the ultimately, uh, as a political, economic, and, and scientific and other issue, that costs will be taken into account, and there will be some sort of cost-benefit uh, weighing. What I find missing from the discussion is a reckoning. I, I hear a lot of pie in the sky and a lot of predictions, but uh, how are we going to reduce our per capita consumption from 20 to 25 tons a year down to 2 tons a year in 40 years? And uh, what's, is, we know a lot about the law of diminishing returns, and we know about the physics mm -hmm. of, uh, of the, you know, wind and solar are the least dense energy sources, and there's a limit to the, to the ability, of the efficiency that can be reached with those things. We haven't talked about reaching those. And I, my question is, uh, I'm familiar with a thing called the Copenhagen Consensus, uh, which has, when you expose a hundred people, well-educated people, and brief them fully on the costs and the benefits of, of energy, of getting rid of, of, of fossil fuels uh, versus the other problems we have that include hunger and poverty and water supply and a host of other problems. Uh, when you compare that, that cost, Okay, well, I'm just going to ask, do you think you've left... Sorry for falling down on the job. Do, yeah. you, do you think you've left the, the most important part of this discussion out of it, which is assuming that there are unlimited benefits to the nearly unlimited costs you're talking about to get from 20 to 2 uh, tons a year? Okay, I'm going to summarize that as being, is it actually doable at a cost that's worth it? Uh, and I will ask that maybe of Alexis. So we're going to start. So Russ, China. China. So China is the second biggest energy consumer in the world behind the United States. And they have, I think, an energy policy where they're going for all sources of energy to supply the economy. Coal plants, absolutely amongst them. Amongst them. If you've ever been to Beijing and experienced what the air quality is there, you know, there's, there's, there's a great challenge. Um, however, however, I think China is extremely progressive in looking at other forms of energy that can help their security equation. We're, we're actually partners with them on two 4,000 square kilometer blocks that have shale gas or unconventional gas potential. They're eager to develop that, and interestingly enough, eager enough to, de eager to develop it in the right environmental way. Sometimes people leave that out of the equation. So I think China's very much about an all of the above strategy you know, as a manufacturing economy that's absolutely vital to their real economy. They are partnering with a number of international companies to be able to bring liquefied natural gas as a resource to their shores. Uh, Shell amongst them, many other companies as well. So I think China's, China's a country to watch. I don't think it's I don't think it's energy development at all cost, but certainly there's going to be a balance there to use the indigenous resources that the country has, which is largely based on coal right now. But they're being very aggressive in development of other resources that may not be as, um, as, as environmentally harmful as coal. If I, okay. I hope I addressed your question. If I didn't, let's talk after. I'm going to redirect the Atlantic's rational middle question. Okay, I'm going to redirect it to Greg because it's his yeah. concept. And I'm going to say, Richard, you forgive me? Um, I'm going to say, Greg, okay, great question. So you're yeah. talking about the rational middle. Does it mean there are crazies on the fringes? And if so, identify the ideas of the crazies you want us not to think about. Well, well you know, I, when we were traveling Hainesville around is when we developed this idea. And it was when we saw this initial polarization sort of just come to bear and really kind of become white hot. And it really, at that point, was sort of the drill baby drill people which are so the drill at any cost, anytime, anywhere people, and then never drill anywhere, anytime people. The ones that are like, we got to get off renewables right now. And what it turned into was a vitriolic argument. And when we were filming Haynesville, it was a different time. Energy wasn't where it was. So if you see the film, you see very smart people from different sides of the issue discussing how to move towards a clean energy future. Once that issue became polarized, or more polarized, that discussion stopped. There was stasis. And I believe that that's kind of where we are right now. Okay. Alexis, I'm going to give to you the question of 
Is this so expensive that maybe it's not worth it compared to all the other terrible things in the world? Well, I, and, and I guess, you know, if I can, I'll talk to you afterwards, but if you do have a chance to pick up Reinventing Fire, I mean, as I said, it is not a prediction that we will get off of fossil fuels by 2050. It is a roadmap. It's a possibility. And it outlines how it can be done. And that possibility, that roadmap, is difficult and challenging. And um, it, it is, however, trillions of dollars more economic to get off of the fossil fuels um, and I keep having to qualify that because we, we don't get completely off of natural gas, um, then to go along the course of business as usual. And the reason it's more economically beneficial is that energy efficiency, for instance, and fuel efficiency in your vehicles and better designed neighborhoods and uh, uh, better products and more efficient appliances and so on and so forth are actually saving companies money every day. If you retrofit your house or your, or your business and you will save money, these things have positive returns on investment. That does not mean that everybody's going to get up and do it because it's hard, the payback might be slower, you don't get it immediately, you, um, you don't have the, the qualifications to understand how to get these things done. You have to hire a contractor, there's transition, there, the transaction costs, these things are difficult. So, okay, I'm gonna it's stop possible, here. but it, it's beneficial. I just wanna let other people at sure. least raise their questions. I, I failed in cutting you guys off earlier, so. Um, so we'll take three questions uh, really quickly, please, sir. Where is nuclear energy in this entire discussion? Okay, and do you want to name a victim? Whoever is most qualified to answer. Okay. Nukes, another question, please. There. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I'm quoting from... Um, from an article that was recently written, and I think it's very important that everybody here be aware of it. it no, no long quotes, though, because we're oh. running out of time, and it's unfair to other people. Well, it's about, um, it's about a comment that Russ made at the very outset, scaring us about the shortage of oil in the future, and this article deals Just with ask your question. I, I don't want to hear a quote. If you can ask it as a question, great. Otherwise, you'll have to talk to Russ afterwards. I'm I'll sorry. I'll talk to Russ afterwards. Thanks. Okay, I'm really sorry. It's just not fair to people. Please. Thanks. Jonathan Halpern with Designing Sustainability. I'm not sure who the question goes to. I'll let the most talented person answer it. But the question is that the <laughs> rational middle sounds great, sort of almost akin to mom and apple pie. I mean, who could be against the rational middle? But then we also heard that we're in a crisis moment from the movie in terms of climate change. There's a word, a pivot point in terms of how we deal with our energy future. And the rational middle and we, is not necessarily the place that I would expect innovation to okay. come from. So the question is about innovation and why do we expect the rational middle to lead us in an innovative direction? Okay, excellent question. And uh, final one, please, ma'am. Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is Jamie Cox, and full disclosure, I work for Shell, and I am an evil big oil lobbyist. So, but not doing a good enough job, <laughs> that's, apparently. That's, that's exactly what I was going to say. Guilty as charged. Um, and it is, it's really difficult, and I, I do feel like sometimes, you know, that we are beating our head against the wall, but, um, you know, we're kind of damned if we do and damned if we don't, because if we go out and hire more lobbyists, we are faulted. So I guess my question here is for Richard, and that is, you know, we do, obviously, that's the big thing we're missing is, is the policy piece. How can we, having been on the government side, you know, are there things that we're not doing that we should be doing? Okay, excellent. Um, let's start with that one. Richard, how can Shell lobbyists educate government officials better? Lavish you know, meal. Uh, I won't quite answer that question because it sounds like something that would violate my ethics agreement that I signed in the Obama administration. But um, I think that there are places that are maybe emerging where there's, you know, po politically uh, feasible areas where progress could be made. Um, unclear if that will happen at this point. So uh, a big thing on everybody's mind is the fiscal situation, balancing the budget, right? 
So whereas the notion of a carbon tax was, you know, the T word tax is just like, you know, the third rail of U.S. politics, but that's emerging, but not because of carbon per se, but because the government needs to balance the budget, right? And if you can do that in a way that actually makes the overall tax system more efficient, which you could potentially do, there's maybe an opportunity there. Other places where there tends to be more um, uh, widespread kind of buy-in is the energy security side. So if there, if there are policies that can make progress on the energy security front and at the same time make progress on other fronts, that's good. Those two things don't always go in the same direction though, right? You can make progress on one front and send yourself back on the environment. So it's really careful to find those areas. So energy efficiency is clearly one. I mean, energy efficiency, if it's cost-effective energy efficiency, saves money, reduces emissions, reduces exposure to risks of the energy system. So um, that's one which seems to have uh, broader buy-in. Was there something that's else good. that was No, no, you did it. And now I'm going to ask Alexis to be our nuclear woman. Sure, okay. So um, there's a reason why we haven't seen a lot more nuclear plants being built lately. And that's because they don't, they don't economically stand up. I mean, they, they are too expensive. They have too many risks. And you could not get a, a, any insurance company to insure it or anybody to build it on the free market. And that's just not even getting into the issues of storage and, and uh, potential terrorist attacks and, for heaven's sakes, you know, storms that could cause something like happened in uh, Japan. Okay. No, no, no. We're, I, I'm already being okay. yelled at that we've gone over time <laughs> in silent hand cue ways. Um, so, uh, Russ, to you goes the last question. Um, this notion that the rational middle sounds like a lovely place to be, but probably you need crazy people to get the kind of innovation that we need for change. I'd, I'd actually like you to. You want to take that question? I, I'd okay. Like, That's, like it's, to, it's, your, it's your topic. I, 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 Go yeah, for I'd, it. I'd, I'd, I'd like to answer it because, um, you know, when we were making this series, and by the way, please visit rationalmiddle.com. We're going to be releasing 10 films in this first round. We'd love to get your feedback. We want to get you part of the discussion. Um, the rational middle um, is this place, and it exists because people are fed up. People are sick of the polarization that's out there. And, you know, to me, we went out and we talked to about 30 energy experts um, from around most of the United States and a couple in Canada. And they all seem to agree that, that, that innovation and the way forward really exists in a place that does not exist on the polarized sides. It's the people in the middle that understand that you've got to make a compromise. You've got to put everything on the table. You have to go forward in a rational, sensible, affordable, and a sustainable way that that's the only way to an energy future. So I actually think that most of the passion is either in the rational middle or it's moving there. Okay, so to summarize, the crazy people actually are the ones in the middle. Um, I'm going to do a very final blitz round. Okay, guys, just one sentence. Tell us the one new, new thing. It can be in like the next fossil fuel, the next renewable fuel, the great new policy idea, the next film you're going to make. What's the new, new thing? Um, well, again, I think that the, the coolest new thing that's coming out is energy innovation, and we're going to make films about them. So for, ch check us out. Richard? Uh, bringing the IT revolution to energy decision making in our automobiles, in our houses, and in the way that we make decisions. Russ? Energy within our borders is going to dramatically decrease the supply that we need from external resources to the point that those, those, those suppliers are very concerned about it. Alexis? Sol solving the problem from our communities uh, and our local situation up from our cities and going forward that way, solving it locally um, and then going forward from there. Okay, join me in thanking a rational but never boring panel.